Good morning. Good morning. Mark, come on, man. You got you have to step it up now. It's great to have everybody with us this morning. Before we get started uh, with our uh, sermon this morning, I want to en- encourage you by going ahead and giving you a piece of your practice for this week. You know, when I think about uh, our joining together, and I'm always grateful at the opportunities that we have to get together and to uh, be able to worship God together in unity and in spirit and in truth. I'm also mindful that there are those who were here this week who might not have been here last week. Or maybe there are those who are not here this week who were here last week. I want to encourage us specifically this week uh, to make sure that we make an effort to reach out to those, whether it be on the pews next to us, family members who were close to us, friends or co-workers. I know we're not in school, but maybe even classmates um, that we encounter throughout the week. And bring somebody with you. And next week's a good week for us to do so. VBS is always a, a good opportunity to bring in. Uh, at least it makes some people, uh, it makes for some people a good opportunity for them to come in and to experience our worship together with God. And I would encourage you to invite them. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that practice here in just a moment. But I do want to talk about this, this phrase, powerful through all eternity. I was talking with one of my friends recently, and we were discussing uh, some sermons that they had been preaching, and uh, sermons that I've been preaching, this, that, and the other, and we do that a lot. Uh, that's how, we, you know, somebody always asks me, how do you always know what to preach on? I don't. Sometimes i got to ask others, hey, what you've been studying? What, what have you been looking at lately that you find interesting? And this is one of those things that was pointed out to me that I just found beautiful. And so what we're going to talk about today is, is Christ, who is powerful through all eternity. This is just going to be one aspect of Christ that we're going to study. And I want to talk about just a few of those here for a moment. The, the, the main focus is viewing or seeing Christ through all the ages. So the first section is powerful through all eternity. The next will be present within creation. A look at His power and His presence within that moment in which the world began. The next is going to be promised to the patriarchs. A look at the patriarchal stage throughout our history or throughout man's history and, and how he was uh, speaking with them and promised unto them at least and then prophesied among the Jews. And that's a little bit more familiar with because we see a lot more of that even within the New Testament, which we tend to focus on a little bit more. And then we see the coming of Jesus where he became perfect while he was on this earth. And then when we see his providing of salvation, that's more so his actions today. He provides for us today Salvation, And then the last place that we will look is that he is praised in eternity. And don't, don't start to get a little scared. This is not the sermon points for today. This is some upcoming sermons, some things that we're going to talk about. We're not going to do six points today, just 12. Not, not that many. It'll be all right. Some of y'all are awake. Some of y'all already fell asleep. We ain't three minutes in, y'all. Jesus is fully God. That is an important thing for us to encounter, an important thing for us to grasp within our concept of understanding Christ. And understanding Jesus and His power throughout all eternity, we must understand that Jesus truly is fully and completely God. He is a part of the Godhead just as much as the Father is and just as much as the Spirit is. And even though we have an account of the Gospels where we see the presence of God in the form of, taking on the form of man in the form of Christ upon this earth and we can look and we can see all His teachings and experience all these moments that He had, oftentimes what happens is because we have that, that description of Him on this earth, we seem to, in some ways, or at least in my mind, separate Him a little bit from the eternality of Christ. What I mean by that, because He took on the form of man and lived on this earth for roughly 33 years, we tend to separate His presence within the creation. His promise to the patriarchs, His prophesied to the Jews, His bringing of salvation unto man today, all these, all these different things that we often might overlook because we forget that He truly is completely and wholly, fully God. So that's what we're going to talk about as we begin this morning. I, I had read for us Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And if you're one of those who takes your, uh, who takes your bulletin and takes the sermon notes... I, I, I didn't mean to do it until I got halfway through the PowerPoint. I've underlined all of your answers. So I went back and underlined a couple of the ones I didn't. So if you've got a little blank there, here's your answers. They're going to be underlined. It's going to be real simple for you today. And if you're not one who takes a bulletin and, and, underline, and uh, fills out it, 
Well, there's your way you can take notes nice and easy and get everything that you can out of this lesson. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. A very beautiful message was read to us just a moment ago by Jack. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. Coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus, who is fully God. Jesus, who, who is fully a part of that Godhead. Who can be seen as equal with the Father and the Spirit. Took on the form of man, humbled himself, and became a bond servant. You know, when we think about the, um, the understanding of the grasp, if you will, of, of the Jews' concept of the Messiah. It's, it's this king who's going to come and he's going to reign in Jerusalem. And he's going to reign on this earthly, uh, with this earthly reign in an earthly kingdom. And so when Jesus comes in the form of a bondservant, what do they do? They miss it. Because they were not expecting this great Messiah to come in the form of a servant. To be humble. They thought about the Messiah's coming as being powerful, as mighty, as a warrior. And instead, he came as a lowly servant who washed people's feet, who went to eat with people that would make other people a little uncomfortable at times, who was a lowly carpenter's son, who traveled around this world, living by the sake and by the grace of others who were willing to support him within his ministry on this earth. And so they missed him. But it's important for us to understand not just that aspect of Jesus coming in the form of a servant, but the, the aspect that reminds us that Jesus is fully God. He is equal. He did not consider it robbery, as Philippians 2 puts it. did not count it as robbery to be made equal with God. didn't consider that as stealing away or taking away from the glory of God. Why? Because He is God. Just as much as the Father, just as much as the Spirit. So when we see the descriptions given of God or the Godhead, this omniscient aspect of things, the all-knowing aspect of things. We see descriptions like, uh, like Psalms chapter 139, verses 1 through 4, which reads, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my, uh, my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. When we see descriptions like that, in Psalm 139, that description of being all-knowing is not just one that is given to the Father. It's not just one that is given to the Spirit. It is also given to the Son. It is also given unto Christ. Or the description in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, of Him being omnipotent or all-powerful. And what is exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ. Notice that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. And seated him at, the right, at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality, all power, all might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age that is to come. Jesus is just as powerful as the Father and the Spirit. Is seated at his right hand is, is the name that is above all names. Jesus is fully God. You could also look to the omnipresent, the all present nature of God. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24, am I a, 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 excuse me, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? The same nature that is described or that is used to describe the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the Godhead in totality in turn also applies specifically to Christ. He is, omni, he is omni, uh, omniscient, excuse me, all-knowing. He is omnip uh, omnipotent, all-powerful, and omnipresent. He is everywhere. And of course, He also is eternal. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. The same descriptions that are used to describe the Godhead as in totality. What we would call God or the Trinity or the Godhead are the same descriptions that can be given specifically to each one of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And of course, 
for the, the sake of our lesson this morning, we specifically want to focus on the fact that those descriptions can be given to Christ. He's all-knowing, He's all-powerful, He's all-present, He is eternal. And that's going to become important, uh, very important in just a moment. As we continue to discuss this, uh, this Christ who is all-powerful and all-powerful specifically throughout eternity. I want you to open to Psalm 136. Psalm 136 is a very beautiful psalm. It's a very interesting psalm, uh, if you will. And there's a lot of, of, of unique and strange things about this psalm. I'm just going to read the first, first three verses real quick. And then I want you to, uh, to kind of see and maybe grasp some of the things that I'm talking about when I say that it's a little bit different. Notice in the first three verses. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endures forever. And if you keep reading all through the 26 verses that you see in Psalm 136, they all end with one specific phrase. What is that phrase? That phrase is, His mercy endures forever. So not only is, God, is Christ uh, uh, taken on the form of man, but has come down in humility, uh, taking, uh, not finding it robbery to be made equal with God. Not only is He all-present, all-powerful, all-knowing, not only is He eternal, but there's a, a certain description that is given concerning the Godhead that I find very beautiful as it pertains to the life of Christ. Because He showed it in a way that we see described sometimes from the point of the the Godhead in totality, sometimes from the aspect of the Father, and oftentimes also from the aspect of the Son. But I find it very beautiful to look at this concept of His mercy endures forever. Now, why, why why would we talk about His mercy enduring forever when talking about the power of Christ? If you'll be reminded concerning those descriptions given of Christ, it was His eternal nature that helps Him to be seen as fully God. This is all-knowing, His all-presence, His all-powerful, His eternal nature that allows for us to see Him as equal with God. And as equal with God throughout all eternity, so also we can see His love throughout all eternity. It's not just that He Himself is eternal, but that the love that He has for man is also eternal. I want us to notice a few things concerning this phrase, His, his uh, mercy endures forever. You'll notice in, in your Bibles in verses 1-3, through there are three descriptions, if you will, given of God. Uh, in, in verse 1 it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, notice this, for He is good. And then we see, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to God, uh, to the God of gods. And then in verse 3, Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. These are actually three different words for describing the same person. Or the same entity, if you will. Three different words to describe God. Um, and, and we see it as two because uh, we don't speak Hebrew. And so we've got one word uh, for two of the different uh, words that are used here. The first of which that is used is Jehovah or Yahweh, as, as you might see it sometimes mentioned. In the New Testament, it will be translated at times. Uh, in fact, the ASV actually uses give thanks to Jehovah. As a way of describing this. Now, this word Jehovah, and we've talked about this in our series when we talked about the names of God. This word Jehovah is a very special word. In fact, it would only be written, not spoken by by Jews. They, They wouldn't even dare speak the name Yahweh or Jehovah. They held so much reverence to that name that they wouldn't even speak it. But this word is used as a way of showing the sacredness of God. Now, why would that be important in a phrase like, uh, that we see in verses 1? Oh, give thanks to the sacredness of God, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, understanding His godlikeness, His sacredness, the, the, the beauty of His godlikeness is an essential part in our service unto Him. The next phrase that we see here is the God of gods. This word God here is the Elohim. Uh, which also uh, was very sacred uh, to the Jewish, uh, to the Jewish uh, body in, in, as a whole. This actually is the first name that we see used to describe God in all the Bible. When you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God, in the beginning Elohim created all things. Elohim created all things. And this, uh, to the Hebrew person, would have been a way of expressing the dignity of God. 
as well as the deity of God. And this includes also a concept of his strength and power. So, uh, blessed be the, um, give thanks to the, the Yahweh or the Jehovah, the sacredness of God, for he is good. And then give thanks to the Elohim of gods, the dignity, the deity, the all powerful, the all sacredness, the strength and power of God, of gods. And then that last one that we see is the word Adonai is used as the word Lord, the Lord of Lords. This is, is probably one that you see most often used when you see the word Lord. It's, it's typically this Adonai. Uh, then when you get into um, the New Testament, you begin to see a little bit more of that Yahweh. Once again, because the name was so sacred that at times people wouldn't even, uh, people wouldn't dare speak it, but at times people wouldn't even want to write it because of the sacredness of it. Uh, they would have certain rituals that they would even go through before they would, would write the word Yahweh. It's, it's said that many of the scribes, uh, when, when um, writing manuscripts or when copying um, uh, the manuscripts into to making more and more copies, you know, we got a copy machine, they had scribes. Many of the scribes, when they would get to the word Yahweh, of course they're not writing this way, they're writing this way. Um, it, when they would write the word Yahweh, that they would stop and they would pray. And they would do a cleansing ritual before even writing the name God. Yet... In modern times, what is the kind of reverence that is given to the word God? Oftentimes it's taken in vain. It's used flippantly. It's given no respect. It's used in a very disrespectful at times. And yet, this specific word that is used here, the Lord of Lords, uh, the uh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, give thanks to the God of God, give thanks to the Lord of Lords, each of these is used as a very sacred, beautiful thing that is used here. This word that is used... Um, his mercy endures forever that we see. That word mercy is, is pretty tricky, actually. Uh, in fact, if you have a, uh, a Bible translation, um, uh, it, it'll say something different. Uh, if, if you have a different translation from the New King James Version, you probably read something different when you look at Psalm 136. The word that is used here for give thanks to the Lord is the word chesed. If you're reading in the ESV, it says his steadfast love endures forever. In the King James, it says his mercy endures forever. The ASV says his loving kindness endureth forever. The NAS, the New American Standard Version, says uh, his faithfulness is everlasting. The NIV says his, his love endures forever. And the New King James says his mercy endures forever. Each of these translations gives a, a, a very different but in some way similar description of that word has said and the, the the difficulty in that is okay okay well, which one's right i don't know okay <laughs> i'm not a hebrew scholar even hebrew scholars debate that's why in each of your translations it's a different word why because people can't agree on this word has said but here's what they can agree on especially in english although it might appear as mercy or loving kindness or faithfulness or love or steadfast love, although it might appear in many different ways, there is one central idea that is put forth concerning this idea or this concept of uh, hesed in your Bibles. That is that his steadfast love, mercy, kindness, faithfulness endure forever. Each of which point to the eternality of Christ, of God. This word, in fact, wraps up every attribute of God. It talks about His loyal and enduring love. It reminds us of His kindness and His mercy that He has shown to us and continues to show to us. This love is both active and is a practiced love. It helps us to better understand also the nature of God. To put it simply, even though the word has said that is used all throughout Psalm 136 can be confusing at times, the message is simply put that we should be thankful to God because He is God and He loves us. And that love carries with it so many beautiful things. Faithfulness, commitment, mercy, forgiveness, and, and continuation of that love that is shown. And so it is only fitting that in the eternal nature of Christ, in the eternal aspect of God, that we should return that thankfulness. Uh, we should return to his, his, his love and His kindness a great deal of thankfulness. That's why we're talking for this last section this morning, give thanks to the Lord. Now, the beautiful part about Psalm 136, the thing that I absolutely love about it is um, when you get to the end of it, you're kind of exhausted because you just read His, His mercy endureth forever, His loving kindness, you know, whichever translation you're reading in. You just read the same statement 
26 times word for word. Now, there was a little bit of change in the, in the beginning. You know, he talks about different aspects. We're going to talk about that in just a second. He talks about different aspects. But the same, 20, uh, the same message, 26 times, it, it continues time and time and time again to remind you of the eternal loving kindness, mercifulness, and forgiveness of God throughout each of those 26 verses. It reminds us of that eternal nature. And yet, in the same time of, of repeating that, that statement, it's drilling that in our minds. Of course, you know, we know that the best way to memorize is repetition, repetition, repetition. Well, the psalmist says, okay, well, here's 26 repetitions. Here's a way that you can grasp and understand this. You get to the end of, of Psalm uh, 136. What's the message that you need to have understood? Well, there's a whole lot of other stuff at the beginning we're going to talk about in a second. But you at least should grasp the fact that both, Christ, that both God is eternal that includes the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And that also His love is eternal. His love specifically for us is eternal. And then we get to the other side of the verses. The beginning half of Psalm 136. Verses 3, excuse me, ver technically verses 1 and following. But we're going to start in verses 4 and following here. The first of which that he points out of things that we should be thankful for. In giving thanks to the Lord. Excuse me, I didn't realize I had made a, a man... I made a whole little thing with the word has said on it. I forgot about that. My bad. Um, see, I'm not perfect, y'all. I make mistakes. That's why I'm glad for the Lord's loving kindness and for y'all's mercy as well. Verses 4, uh, four through 9, we see that this is a, a cause for giving thanks to the Lord is His creation. Notice how He words it in verses 4 through following. To him alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. And the moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. What is the first thing that we should be thankful for concerning the Lord? Well, we notice in verses 1 through 3 that he he is the King of all kings. Give thanks to the Lord for His eternal loving nature. His Lord of Lordship. His God of Godship. He is the end all be all. And included within that is His actions in the creation account. Not just the creation account that we see in Genesis chapter 1. Not just the laying out of the, 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 the firmament and the skies and all these different things and the division of the birds and the sea, uh, the birds of, of the trees and the fish of the sea, the set and the other. Not all just not just what's in day one through seven, but what has continued the sustainability of this earth that He has created for us. And each one of us in our personal creation is a way of bringing glory and honor to the Father. So, what is it that we can be thankful for concerning Psalm one thirty six? Well, the first thing that is pointed out is that we should be thankful for His creation. The next, of course, is that we should be thankful for His deliverance. If you'll notice in Psalm 136, verses 10 through 15, To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endures forever, and brought them out of Israel from among them, for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand, and with an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea into two, for his mercy endures forever. And made Israel pass through in the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. I think if all of Scripture would be written with a, with a repetitive thing, it would be hard for us to grasp at times. Because we're repeating that, his mercy endures forever, and sometimes we miss. What is it that's being mentioned there in verses 10 through 15? God's constant deliverance for his people. God who saw his people in, in, in torment, being tortured in slavery in the, in the presence of the Egyptians. And so he brings them out, and they face this, uh, the Red Sea, and so what does he do? He divides the Red Sea. And then they face armies, and so what does he do? He, he destroys the armies. They're fearful of Pharaoh, so what do they do? So what does God do? He destroys the Pharaoh. He humbles the Pharaoh. He does all these things. Why? Because His mercy endures forever. He created you. Why? Because His mercy, His love endures forever. He delivers His people. Why? Because His mercy, His love endures forever. We should also be thankful, verses 15 through, 20 through, uh, through, uh, excuse me, 15 through 22, for His guidance as well. Notice as He continues in verse 16, "...to Him who led His people through the wilderness." For his mercy endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. 
and gave their land as a heritage for His mercy endures forever. A heritage to Israel His servant for His mercy endures forever. It's not just His creation of man. It's not His just deliverance of His people. It is also His guidance even in the face of turmoil, distress, or even what seems to be coming destruction, God offers His guidance a way out, if you will. The last thing I want us to look at concerning giving thanks to the Lord is give thanks to the Lord uh, for His people. I think that's a very beautiful way that the psalmist concludes Psalm 136. Specifically in verses 23 through 26, we talk about uh, His people. Notice, who remembered us... In our lowly state. Of course, the psalmist writing concerning the people of Israel, but even us today, we can look at this and, and remind ourselves, has God also remembered us in our lowly states? Absolutely. Why? Why has God remembered us in our lowly state? Why has God remembered the people of Israel in their lowly state? Because His love, His mercy endures forever. And who has rescued us from our enemies? Has He done that for Israel? Yes. Has He done that for us? Yes. Why? Because His mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh... Why? Because His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. The very last verse there in Psalm 136, the summarization of, of that whole question as to why that phrase is there at the end. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Why? Because His mercy endures forever. And what does that mercy do? That mercy created us, delivered us, has guided us, and has made us to be His people and surrounded us with His people. Why is it that I need to focus on the eternal nature of Christ? Because it is in focusing on the eternal nature of Christ that we begin to focus upon the eternal blessings that are found within Christ. If it were the case that Christ was only important as He was on this earth, then all those promises that He brought forth within His eternality, well, they become empty or pointless. But because it is the case that Christ is eternal, so also are those wonderful blessings, those wonderful promises that He brings forth. I mentioned that there is going to be a purpose for this week, a practice, if you will, for this week. We focus this morning specifically on this, Christ powerful through all eternity. And, 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 and included within that all eternity is not just those who are before us, but also those who are after us. I made mention there are some here who are here this week who weren't here last week. And included within that, there are some who are not here this week who were here last week. And so here's our practice for this week. In focusing on the eternality of Christ, and focusing not just on the wonderful blessings of those who have come before us, but also those who are coming after us, I want each of us to be the reason why somebody is here next week. And I don't mean that that's the only reason why people are here. You know, people come to church not for me and you. They come to church to worship God. But maybe what they need is a push or a pull from you to say, Hey, I want you to be here with me. I want you to worship God together with me. I want us to study together uh, and, and, be, and grow together and, and to learn together. And so you need to be the reason this week why somebody is here. What does that take? It takes inviting them. It takes a little bit of courage. It takes a moment to just simply go and do that task. You know, I'm often reminded of many different tactics or ways in which people build up courage. Yeah, it, it, there's, there's two main methods uh, that I can think of, one of which is a little easier than the other, and you'll be able to tell that here in just a second. One is the one, two, three method. Y'all ever heard of the one, two, three method? All right, here's the one, two, three method. You have a moment of fear. Maybe you're, you're in your mind, you're saying, hey, that, that preacher, he, you know, he, he didn't warn me in my practice this week as I got to invite somebody. There's somebody I see every day. There's somebody I see every week. There's somebody right there who has a, a perfect opportunity for me to speak to them. And I'm shaking in my boots. And I'm terrified. Here's the one, two, three method. You count. One, two, three. And then you do it. Count. There's another method. It's called the five minute method. I mentioned one's going to be easier than the other. You want to know why one is easier than the other? One takes three seconds of courage for you to talk to somebody. The other takes five minutes. All right, the five-minute method is this. You set a timer. For five minutes, I'm going to be diligent in doing something for the Lord. And you physically set a timer, whether it's a little one that you have in your, it's a chicken by, by your stove that you set for, for baking something, or that's on your phone, your computer, or you ask Siri or something like that. Or, hey, you can even use the microwave if you want. That's all right with me. 
take five minutes to say, okay, for these five minutes, there is nothing that I'm going to do besides reach out to others who need to be with, here with me next week. And for five minutes, you diligently, you seek, you, you text, you call, you write cards, you walk to the neighbor's house, you, you talk to the person in the cubicle next to you. You for five minutes say, for the next five minutes, nothing will have my attention besides my willingness to do the will of the Father in inviting somebody to be here with me next week. I told you, one's easier. Start with the three seconds. And you'd be surprised once you set that timer for five minutes, oftentimes you'll find yourself, I want to keep going. The, the, the starting factor is the hardest part at times. That five minutes starts, you keep going. You keep doing what's right. Each of these challenges, each of these practices that we will give are ones that start behind me and work their way forward. Each of us need to make an effort to make sure that we can be together with God. When I mention the eternal nature of Christ, I find that very beautiful because I can look back to those uh, of the Old Testament and see how the sacrifices that they made helped to push towards that sacrifice that Christ gave upon that cross that cleansed uh, both forward for those who would obey Him and also backwards for those who had obeyed Him. Which means that when I look to people like Abraham or Moses or David or, or I look to, to faithful individuals like Paul or Peter and I look to John and all these wonderful different things, and I say, okay, I will get to be reunited with them. It's a beautiful thought, but guess who else I'll get to be reunited with? Some family members who I haven't seen in a long time. Why? Because they've gone on to their reward. Who will I also get to see? Maybe some people who I will have never met upon this earth. Maybe even those who have come behind me in my family who I never got the chance to experience. And how do, how do we know for sure, that, or how can we secure in a way uh, make things secure in a way that I can be pr- uh, filled with joy and with excitement of meeting and reuniting with those who have gone before and had that same joy and excitement of those who have come after me. I put forth the effort to make sure that those who I encounter, those who come after me, know that they have a place that they can come to. Many of us here this morning are surrounded by people who we love, but many of us here this morning have empty spots in our pews that are reserved for our family who are not here. Many of us who are here this morning have children or grandchildren or brothers and sisters or parents who are not here and could be and should be here. And yet we are the best person to reach out to them. We are the best person to make sure that they know they are loved and appreciated by God and have just as much of a right to be here and to be forgiven of their sins as you do. And we're the best opportunity that they have to encounter the Messiah and all of that eternal blessings that He offers through His love. And they're not here because we haven't done anything about it. You might be the best door, the best opportunity, the best reason for some of your loved ones to come to church, to encounter Christ, to be made whole, to be made complete, and therefore can be with Him for eternity and with you. For eternity in heaven. And yet we have so many opportunities that we pass on. Week by week. Day by day. Moment by moment. What is our practice for this week? Reach out to those who we love. Those who need to be here with us. Those who have had every opportunity to be here with us. And maybe didn't because we didn't do anything about it. Because we didn't say anything. Reach out to them and say, I want you here next week. I'm going to church to worship God. I'm going to church to be with my people. I'm going to church to enjoy a wonderful week of VBS and encouraging and strengthening children to learn more about God. And I want you there with me. We cannot anticipate for growth within this congregation, for strengthening within the future generations. We cannot anticipate for an eternal resting place where we can reunite with those who have come after us if we are not willing to teach those who come after us. Or teach those who surround us today who we love and care for. But we cannot expect them to be right with God if we ourselves are not right with God. That's where things come into play today. Your task for this week, invite somebody to church. Somebody that you love and you care for, invite them to church. Your task today is to make sure that you yourself are right with God. Maybe it's the case this morning that you never put on Christ in baptism. You're in no place to be inviting somebody to, to worship the God of all creation, to experience the God of all creation, to follow after the God of all creation, if you yourself have not obeyed the gospel. In the same fashion, in the same way, 
If you are somebody who has been baptized but has been living a life of sin, you are in no place to welcome somebody back to the home of God if you yourself are not in with, the, in with God, in, in a good standing with the Lord. If you yourself are living a life of sin, or maybe it's the case that what you need this morning is encouragement. Case, I know. I know I read my Bible. I see Matthew 28. I, I, I read Mark 16, 16. I see the Great Commission. I see that we're to go and teach other people. I get it. I understand, but I'm scared. We're here to help you. I hope you're here to help me. Because at times I get scared. At times I get weary. At times I lose motivation. And that's when I need to rely upon you. In the same way you need to rely upon the congregation. Help strengthen and build you up. Maybe it's the case this morning that you're not a member of the church through baptism. That you have separated yourself from God through a life of sin after baptism. Or that you simply need encouragement. Do not go out and invite others to church. And invite them to experience the eternal power of Christ. If you yourself are not a partaker of that eternal power. If we can help you this morning, please come while we stand and while we sing. Jesus alone.